Hey friends, Andrea Lake here on the Andrea Lake 101 podcast, and it's the episode everyone has been waiting for where we talk about Stickergate. My God, thank God for Stickergate. So where are we in the story? It is quarter three of 2024. So we're going to start on July 1st and bring us right up to present date. After that, We'll do week on week so you can watch the expansion and growth of all of the companies that I'm working on. For those of you that are new, my name is Andrea Lake. I've started 14 companies since I was 18 years old, including Sticker Junkie, Yoga Junkie, Delinquent Distribution, which owned the exclusive sales rights on the merchandise for Minecraft, World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, The Walking Dead. I wrote a book called How to Build a T-Shirt Empire with my business partner, Dan Caldwell from Tap Out. I started the Powered Chick Mafia and many, many, many other companies. And I had been retired and living my best life in beautiful Sedona, Arizona for the last seven years when, lo and behold, there was some very bad things that happened in my company. Basically, all of the bad things that happened in my companies that forced me out of retirement. And when I came out of retirement, I was like, hey, look, I've always been really private. And I think it's time for me to be really public and to do something that could build truly a legacy to teach people entrepreneurship and to allow people to watch what it looks like to actually grow a brand. So that takes us to July 1st. Finally, all of the rebuilding is pretty well underway. We have the compliance issues under control. We have the production issues under control. And I've hired a bunch of new staff. And now I need to hire a bunch more staff because I want to be properly staffed. So as I'm growing, as I'm expanding, as I am for the very first month in the company, rolling out a whole entire sales plan, I all of a sudden set a goal. And it is the first goal that I've set in the company within my, at that point, seven months of being there. And the goal is to make $75,000 in July. So I got out my trusty whiteboards and all of my very cute inks and... I laid out exactly how we were going to do that, a roadmap to get us to $75,000 in sales in July. Now, that's only $3,000 a day. That is not a lot of money. This company used to do about $4 million in revenue, but I had been out of the company. And if you want to know how it got to that point, go back and watch the first three episodes. So it is to approach a bunch of clients, to have meetings with all of these different places, to relaunch Google ads, to relaunch the TikTok Instagram, et cetera, because we just had not been doing any social media (laughs) to figure out the podcast, which I am recording right now, and also to sell a bunch of new stuff to Hot Topic, as well as get a bunch of private customized back pages up. I made a super cute thermometer sort of a board that we would put more stickers on as we started to get more sales throughout the month. And I launched 250 private customized back pages to our biggest customers with a great discount code that said, hey, look, we created this very easy new format for you to purchase stickers through. You can go on your own private customized back page and you can get stickers that your company orders. You can pass this out to every single one of your employees. You just go within your own customized private back page and get whatever you want. You can click right on them. You order right through our portal right there. It's super fast. It's super easy. And it prevents people from getting caught up waiting on approvals if they're in a larger company. So I'm super excited by all this. Like we're trucking along. Things are going. And the week before sticker gate, we have our first cash positive week. We hit our $3,000 a day goal. We are riding high. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I can see how much people are liking these back pages, and I'm securing meetings with very big companies through my business networks. And I'm just psyched. Like, let's go, let's run, let's run fast, let's make all the money. But now I need people. So it's July 1st, and how do you find new people? So towards the end of June, actually, I ran a very cool ad that was very well written, and it was very transparent, and it was very honest. And the cadence of it was like, hey, must love dogs, come to work for Sticker Junkie. We're hiring for this position, this position, this position, some graphic designers. We needed some people who knew how to do social media and reels. We needed some more people in production. And I started getting intensely amazing resumes. 
hundreds of them. And all of a sudden I click into one and it is this woman who used to work for Cultura. So for anyone not familiar, she was an industrial designer. IDEO and Cultura are sort of two of the biggest hitters in that space where if some humongous massive brand needs a product, they will sometimes coordinate with an organization like this to create beautiful new products. And this woman was an industrial designer, her name's Emily. And I scheduled a Zoom interview with her. And within two minutes of the Zoom interview, I'm like, girl, why the fuck are you on the phone with me right now? Literally, I just said that. I'm like, obviously, we want you. She had sent me over her portfolio. It was gorgeous. Her ability to create furniture and design actual physical products was intensely amazing. This is something we do need sometimes within our companies to do sticker towers, to do all sorts of different things. But more than that, when I read her resume, I mean, she was a jack of all trades. So I was just like, how are you applying for this job? I think we were advertising it then at like $20 an hour or something. And she's like, I don't know. I read it and I was curious. So now I'm on the phone with you. And at the end of our call, she said, I'm still curious. I'm like, come down here and just let's meet in person. So we meet in person and I talked to her and I had sent her afterwards and it was great. But I just thought there is no way that she's coming on. Like her salary is six figures. It is not whatever amount I was advertising at the time, which I think was like $20 an hour. Uh, But I explained the exact financial situation we're in, that I reassess salaries every quarter, that I understand what people's salary requirements actually are, and that I have an eye to get everybody up to the salary that they want within a year. And that when I win, everyone wins. And if you are in my company and you ride this ride with me, it's a seven-year ride to roll out all of these businesses, a bunch of the 14 businesses we're going to roll out within the next year, then you will win. And we will come up with parameters along the way and you will see that you will win because I really will reassess your salary every quarter until you're up to a proper compensation as quickly as we can, as quickly as we're cash positive. I will add benefits onto the salary. And she left the interview after having talked to Brianna. I came later to find out that Brianna is the reason that she took the job. Emily said to me, look, you could just be crazy or you could just be... I don't know, are you like leading a cult? Are you lying? What is going on here? What have I responded to? Because as soon as she was in there, I told her, oh yeah, you have to sign off on a name and likeness release because we're coming out with a podcast that's going to roll into a television show and we're going to track the whole journey and the whole trajectory of it as we go. I'm going to be transparent with my numbers. I'm going to teach people lessons about entrepreneurship along the way. And whoever likes what we're doing is going to follow along. And she was like, What did I just step into? So she said to me, well, I am interviewing for some big girl jobs. And I was like, "Mm mm-hmm, I bet you are. And I need to take like a week or a week and a half or whatever she needed and think about it. And I said, okay, very good. And then I left her a couple of days later while she was still thinking about it. I left her a voice message, just reinforcing, just like two or three minutes, reinforcing that this is where I'm going and I'm going to get there. And I'm going to get there way further and way faster when I have the right team. And I can feel that you are a right team member for us. If you would like to give it a chance, please do that. And then I just left her alone. And I sent her a small snippet of my book proposal, which really laid out, this is what we're doing. This is who I am. This is what I have done. I hope that you come run with us. And long story short, she said yes. And then it was many months later that she said, well, I guess it wasn't that many months later, it was several weeks later that she said the reason she came on was because of Brianna, because she's like, I don't know, Brianna's just such a straight shooter and you're so off in this huge, massive vision that you're holding for the company. But if you could convince Brianna and she is here and she's working hard every day, then you must be a good person. And I'm like, I feel like that's a pretty... Fair statement. If Brianna likes you, you're probably good people. And said that same thing with several other people who I hired in on staff. And some of them are still with us and some of them are not. That just normally happens in a company. But I only hire people that I like. So every single person that has touched my company in any way since I have been back in there, any of the new hires, I really, really like them. Whether it turns out to be a life fit for them or not, I actually just really like them or I wouldn't have hired them in the first place. And so pretty quickly, we were up to a crew 
seven or eight people, which is fantastic. And we're hitting the goals for the first time, but it's hard. Getting all of the meetings with all of the clients that I would want to have meetings with is not easy. And some of them are more receptive than others. And I'm meeting with some very big clients where the founders of those companies are just not very nice. They're not very nice to me when I talk to them on the phone. They're not the type of people that I would naturally want to do business with because I do have a no asshole rule. And one person was particularly a little bit rude on the phone unnecessarily uh, after we had done tons and tons of like mock-ups for them. And it was very clear that we just didn't share the same values. And I was talking to dozens of people at this time, but this one particular client was really quite a big client. And I was like, damn it, I'm going to have to move forward with this, like it or not, because I need the money. And that was really disconcerting to me. And then a lot of the other meetings that I was trying to set up, they just weren't happening. Like I was trying to set them up. I was not setting them up. I did just get the very first Hot Topic order for stickers. They're so exciting. And they were selling our t-shirts. They already have tested 10 designs. A few of them have gotten sell through, which is fantastic. That means they're an all store. That's under my company, Delinquent Distribution, uh, which also does sell under the name Sticker Junkie. Stuff is trucking along. So I can see that success is assured, but I do not know, even if we're going to hit the overall goal for the month, we're about, we're close. We're about $8,000 off of where we should be on July 13th, which was a Sunday. And so I am in a meeting with Brianna and we're just like strategizing. And she came up with a totally brilliant idea to get the rest of the sales that we needed. It was a tense meeting for a while because we were just in for a long slog. It looked like July was going to be a long month. It looked like August was going to be a long, hard month of just clawing our way slowly up to where we wanted to be. But I've done that before. I've done that before 14 times. I've done that before in multiple companies. I am a Capricorn. I do not mind a slow, steady climb up a mountain. I also am a big hiker. I hike almost every day, regardless of where I am in the world and have for years and years and years and years. I just knew I'm in it for the long run here. I'm going to make this happen. I have this incredibly, incredibly ambitious goal to do 22% compounding growth month on month. That is not possible in most companies, but our numbers were so low that 22% wasn't that much. That meant I wanted to do 75,000 in sales in July, 93,000 in August, and so on and so forth, a little bit incrementally at a time so that we could hit 4 million in revenue in the calendar year from July 1st. Of, I actually did 7 7 because I think it's more fun. So July 7th of 2024 to July 7th of 2025. My goal was to hit 4 million in sales. That seemed like a very big, very hard goal from where I was standing when 75,000 in a month at that moment was a stretch, but we had just gotten everything in line. And now all we needed was the sales. And I have been doing sales since I was a kid. I used to go door to door and did fundraising for KRAL, which is the California Abortion Rights Action League. I worked for NARAL. I worked for the National Organization of Women. And I was a fundraiser when I was like 17, 18, 19 years old. I did that while I owned the company that did Rhythm Sticks. And I was really, really good at it. And so that's how I sort of cut my teeth into getting good at sales and being able just to talk to people immediately from the moment that I met them and make them comfortable and just form a very quick relationship with someone door-to-door -door sales will teach you how to do that and especially door-to-door -door fundraising at dinner time on a controversial topic i can't even imagine doing that today this was back in the early 90s when people were still nice to each other and like i could be pro-choice and you could be pro-life and we could disagree on that fundamentally mentally and we would never see things the same way never but everybody was nice about it that very often cases is not the case now. If somebody is on one side of vaccines and somebody's on the other or abortion or gay marriage, it feels like the polarization on these issues is just the chasm is so deep and people are immediately so drawn to volatility and anger. And it's just such a shame because when I grew up in the 80s, you, you would just talk to people. 
And if someone was a Democrat, they were a Democrat. If they were a Republican, they were a Republican. If they were an independent, they were an independent. If they were a Green Party or Libertarian or something else, that's just what they were. And I sort of always felt my whole life, like my party doesn't really exist. The party of, we are just not going to agree on these issues. So let's fix all the things that we do agree on. And I wish it did. Unfortunately, these issues are so fundamental to our freedoms and to our rights that, of course, they need to be resolved. But I think it's just a shame that we're not putting a lot more effort into making sure that people don't go bankrupt when little kids get cancer, because everyone agrees on that. So that being said, I never infused any of my politics into any of my companies because it was unnecessary. And also because like many, 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 many Americans, I am in the middle. I agree with some people on some things, with other people on other things. And I think there's tons of solutions in the middle that we're not really looking at right now. And I hate how divided this country is. It makes me so sad. And when I talk to somebody who's incredibly polarized on one side or another who has forgotten that it is a field of information that I find very, it's very, very infrequent that there is an absolute right and an absolute wrong. I don't find that to usually be the case. I find that the longer I talk to people, the more I understand their point of view. And the longer they talk to me, the more they understand mine. I think that most, most political issues come down to economics and they can't fit onto the back of a bumper sticker, which is why when somebody yells a very easy five or seven word solution to an incredibly complicated problem, that, that's nuts. And it doesn't work. And if it worked, it would already be solved. And so just in general, I don't engage in political discussions with anyone unless I am at the Global Economic Institute or somewhere where I'm going to have an actual deep, respectful, mindful discussion with someone regardless of where they are on any political spectrum and actually have a deeper conversation into what they believe in. So on July 13th, out of the clear blue sky, the founder and CEO of, co-founder of Sticker Mule posted, I think he posted maybe on the 12th or something on Twitter. And then on that Sunday, right after Brianna and I had come up with this brilliant idea, expand our sticker junkie sales. And guess who we were trying to steal clients from? The biggest player in the space. And then when I saw that Sticker Mule was giving away a cyber truck, when you ordered like 50 stickers for $9 or some crazy, insane deal that there's no way that we could do or that we could match, we would lose money on every single order. We are a small company. We cannot compete with a really big company in that way. She got a text and she said, oh my God, I think Sticker Mule has been hacked. And I was like, really, why? She's like, they just sent me a pro Donald Trump text suggesting that I like buy a t-shirt that shows my support for Donald Trump. And I was like, what? No, they did not. That can't be real. And we're noticing an uptick on the traffic on our website, but it wasn't huge on Sunday. So I go, I read the text and I was like, oh my God, this might be really good for us because I believe in freedom of speech. I have always printed stickers for everyone. I still print stickers for everyone. Some people immediately like knee-jerk response wrote some very negative reviews on our site. And I'm just like, well, I haven't even said anything. Like, what are you doing? Just because somebody is one thing and very polarized on one side does not mean that somebody else is very polarized on the opposite side. And I always loved what Michael Jordan said. He was a very well-known Democrat. He was on 60 Minutes. And one of the interviewers said, hey, why don't you come out and really publicly say that you're a Democrat? And he said, because Republicans buy shoes too. And I am not a Democrat. I'm an independent voter. And everyone buys stickers too. It was extra weird that all of this whole controversy that I am about to tell you about was surrounding Sticker Mule's CEO's love for Donald Trump. Because I actually know Donald Trump. I knew him quite well. I knew him personally. I am featured in a book that just came out last month called Apprentice in Wonderland, because I, in fact, was a contestant on The Apprentice back in the day. 
So I'm an old school reality TV star before there was even such a name as reality TV star. And I was this much famous. And I was like, this is probably not for me. I don't really like being famous. And then I became very private for a very long time. But this, it just so happened that this Apprentice in Wonderland book by Ramin Satuti came out right before Stickergate broke. And TMZ covered it twice. Like it's a best-selling New York Times best-selling book. TMZ does not usually cover books. <laughs> they ran two articles on this book. And I have a three-page story in there, a three-and-a-half-page story. Do you guys want some tea? Do you want to hear how that happened? So as I'm rebuilding these companies, as you saw from the last episode, I love to drink wine. I love to drink red, red wine, as a matter of fact. My favorite wines are Papillon, Prisoner, and Saldo. If y'all are listening, you can just send me some and I will talk about it and drink it on the air. So I'm drinking my lovely red wine one night. During the whole rebuild of the company, I had been taking several segments of 30 days no alcohol. I was just very hyper-focused on what I was doing and I wanted clarity and I didn't want the sugar in the wine to keep me up at night, which started to happen to me as I got older. It was so sad. But I had just ended a 30-day stint of no alcohol and it was the only time that the fact checker for Apprentice in Wonderland could talk with me that worked with both of our schedules. He's another uh, journalist at, I think it's the New York Times. and. He called me up and I said, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm drinking wine tonight and I'm a little buzzed. And he's like, that's fine. So I have done interviews like this before over the years, barely ever, almost never. But this guy was so nice in the way he approached me. And he said, oh, Donald Trump is participating in this book. Do you want to be in this book? And I was like, sure, you can interview me. And I know how these interviews go. Generally speaking, I will talk to someone for an hour, for an hour and a half, maybe 20 minutes only. Even if I talk to them for an hour or an hour and a half, which is how long I did talk to this guy, they usually take one sentence from that hour and a half conversation. And then they take one sentence from like every contestant that was on that season and roll it into whatever story that they are fitting it into. So I said to him, I've been drinking a little wine. Do you want the real tea? Because I'll tell you about my whole experience on The Apprentice if you want to hear it. Then instead of doing one sentence in this book, he told the whole ass story. There will be another mini-sode that I do where I actually read the excerpt from this book and go over it and tell you even more details of the story. But long story short, I was on The Apprentice. I was completely kicking ass. Donald Trump and I got along famously well, which was super shocking to me because I had heard, one of my mentors has, knows him personally, and they both were big deals in Manhattan. And just was like, he's super unethical. He doesn't pay contractors. He's always wrapped up in litigation. He's incredibly litigious. And he also has filed for bankruptcy a number of times for corporate bankruptcy. And I personally don't have many political issues that I am very strong about, but I think that it should be a criminal action to, as a strategy, continually over and over and over again, take money from banks, run the company into the ground, and file for corporate bankruptcy, which eventually the taxpayers end up absorbing while, while maintaining personal wealth. I don't think that that should be allowed, but different institutions, LLCs, and different protections that wealthy people have do allow that. That is fine. It's all, that, that is a legal thing. That is a thing that is, people are allowed to do. I personally find it unethical. And as a result, I did not think I would like him. Except for when I met Donald, <laughs> he was... Legitimately, very funny, very charming, incredibly charismatic. And this was a long, long time ago. He presented very differently when I met him. I mean, this was like 18 years ago, almost 20 years ago. And so fine. Had a completely fine time on The Apprentice. And I will do a whole episode that recounts my journey on The Apprentice at some point. Because it's if you would like to get the behind the scenes, my NDA on that show was up decades ago. I go on the show, I meet him, and we get along great honestly. And that was that. But suffice it to say, I think that's what it looks like to actually be actually in the middle, which is just like, look, you have very different points of view from me. If you would like to vote one way, vote one way. If you would like to vote another way, vote another way. That was not the cadence of the message that came out. At least that was not how it was taken by many, many, many people. So here is, so it didn't stop at the text message. The next day, they sent out an email, and that is when life turned around for Sticker Junkie. The email said, 
I've been terrified to say that I support Donald Trump. Other people, Americans, shouldn't live in fear. I support him. And many at Sticker Mule do also. And many at Sticker Mule also support Biden. Okay, so fair. That's fair. Then he suggests that people use a discount that he's offering, that a shirt that is normally $19 is $4 instead, and that they use that $4 discount to show their support for Donald Trump. As you can imagine, many, many corporations do not want to be politically involved, period. <laughs> Any side. They don't want to declare for one side or another. They don't want to work with vendors that are incredibly vocal politically for an incredibly divisive political figure. And a lot of members of the LGBTQ community and a lot of, a lot of universities no longer have wanted to be associated with a company that is sending out these types of emails. And then they followed it up by a couple other campaigns, basically at the same time, like right around the same time. One of them where a guy is naked in the office, it's selling temporary tattoos. A woman walks into his office. She thinks the tattoos are very funny. He um, turns around and has his genitals in her face. And she also thinks that's funny. <laughs> It's like, I get what they were going for. It's like an ad that would have been funny and edgy and commonplace like in the early 90s. And the, the ad ends with a guy with his dick at face height in this woman's face with his arm, hand touching her bare shoulder. And that's the ad. And I'm like, Huh. Okay. Everyone has a different sense of humor and clearly you're edging your way into an audience and cool, cool. Keep going. Keep talking, brah. It's all working. It's all working. They then followed that up uh, with a comedian who has a lot of followers and they came up with something called the R word pass, which is similar to the monopoly pass, um, giving you permission to call people retard again, and that you can give your R word pass sticker to someone from the PC police, uh, if you are offended by someone calling people retarded, they ran this ad. Everyone has their own sense of humor and this is their sense of humor and cool. You do you. I will never tell anyone how to run their company. I had a lot of people say to me, aren't they worried about X, Y, Z? Like, aren't they worried about losing blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, they've chosen a lane. And my guess is that whatever amount of customers they lose, they probably will gain the same amount of customers. They very segmented themselves into one side. And I talked to a friend of mine who's a big Trump supporter, and I showed him the R word pass ad. And he said, well, to be fair, our language is getting policed. And I was like, cool, cool. Okay. But you do realize that the, the permission of free speech that you're fighting for right now is the permission to be an asshole. Like, you get that, right? And to just, like, make fun of people <laughs> and to call them names that we sort of as a society decided, let's not use that word anymore. And if you want to, you totally can. But a lot of people are going to think you're a dickhead. So no worries. I swear a lot. Some people really don't resonate with the fact that I swear a lot. And they're not going to like me and they're not going to like my company because I have a bit of a potty mouth. And that is okay. And some people are not going to like Sticker Mule <laughs> when they are very consistently warning you about the woke police and their stickers and wow, and have come up with campaigns that are, I don't know what they're trying to do. I'm not going to make any assessment on that. What I do know is the days, in the days before Stickergate, we really were up in sales. So we were averaging about like 10.1 sales a day, which was like up for us. And of course, I had a trajectory and a goal to get to 150 sales a day by the end of the year and to just claw my way up and to do really smart, very clever, very funny ad campaigns. I am a slogan writer by trade. That's why I have sold so many tens of millions of t-shirts. A lot of them just had funny slogans that I came up with on them. And so we were drilling into all of these very cute, very clever campaigns when Stickergate came down. And I was like, what? What is happening here? Keep going. Keep talking, bro. 
do another one. It's hilarious. I can't wait to see what they come out with next. So very, very quickly in response to all of the ads that are coming out and a lot, they were doing like a lot of commenting back to people on social media that disagreed with them. The comments were not things that I would say to my clients, no matter what political, I wouldn't, I don't have political conversations with my clients, but to each their own. And like, that's his jam. And he's super excited about it and cool, cool. And keep going, just keep going. It's working out great. Uh, Obviously I am a big supporter of LGBTQ rights and So we did post some of our pride stickers and we posted some very funny Instagrams and very funny TikToks. And as you can see, uh, when Sticker Mule very first launched their political uh, messaging, we had 1,600 followers originally on July 13th. On July 15th was when they sent out the email suggesting that people use the discounted t-shirts to buy a $4 t-shirt that shows their support for Donald Trump, we went that day from 1,900 followers to 23,000 followers in a day. Um, And we kept doing very cute, very fun things on our social media. We really pointed out that like, hey, this is a women-run, women-owned company. I came up with a discount code by donkey that was 15% off and our very very talented artist Carly from Trad Sticky came up with very cute by donkey stickers we came up with some I survived sticker gate stickers we came up with some not a hot sauce company stickers just cute stuff and we released a message from this from the CEO sharing the ethos of the company And really just said for the first time ever, hey, this is a women-owned, women-operated company. And of course, as we have expanded and we now have 16 employees, we also have hired in men also. It just so happened that the first seven employees were women. And we leaned into that in social media. Um, And it worked out really well for us. A lot of people wanted to buy from a company that's 100% women-owned. So yes to that. And a lot of people just wanted a different vendor in general because they didn't want to just like open their their emails and get a really political message. They did not opt in to receive political messaging. They just buy stickers. And of all of the competitors that I'm aware of, I had ordered all of the samples of all of the different competitors. And the thing is, the thing about the stickers from Sticker Mule is they're really good. They're really high quality. They're exactly the same as ours because we use the same material suppliers. And a lot, a very lot of our competitors have moved on to these very fast machines that are faster than the type of machines that we use at Sticker Junkie. However, they're a different material and the material simply is not as good. It does not withstand seven to 10 years plus of outdoor life. It's not weather guarded in the same way. It's just a whole different process. And so, As soon as people started ordering our sample packs and ordering test orders from us, the very first day that it went big, July 15th, I think was the first day that we really just got a ton of sales. We got 102 sales. We have been targeting like 12, I think is what we actually wanted to get that first month, 12 sales day. The next day we got 120 sales. The next day we got 100 sales again. So all of a sudden we are getting an intense, insane amount of volume. And for any of you who ever have been in a scaling business, that can destroy a company because you don't all of a sudden have 10 times more graphic designers, 10 times more people in production, 10 times more people to manage the social media, 10 times more people to just do the shipping. You just don't have that much, even though your sales has increased 10 X. And All of that happened six weeks ago, and we just caught back up last week into, or two weeks ago, into our normal turnaround times. We hired nine new people into our company immediately, and then I got a phone call from an old friend of mine who I worked with at Jinx, and Jinx was the company 
that owned the licensing rights on Minecraft, World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, The Walking Dead, and all of these other, you know, uh, they did stuff with Star Wars and The Hobbit and Assassin's Creed and like so many different video game companies. I'm forgetting dozens of them. And they had scaled this company up and their very first number one employee who I had known since he started with the company because I had been working with Jinx for so long, helped them scale up to, I don't know the exact number, 75 or 110 or 120 million in annual revenue, but a lot, like a very lot of annual revenue with all of the contracts that they had. And he said, hey, by the way, because Jinx, all of the founders went their separate ways and all started different companies and they're all doing great. Uh, But that company itself, it doesn't, doesn't exist in the same way anymore. So that guy didn't work there anymore because of that. And so he called me, Brian, my good friend, Brian, who was the VP of operations at Jinx and had already scaled a company from baby beginning, hardly doing any revenue up to a hundred million in revenue. And that is exactly what I needed. I needed a very, very strong chief operations officer. Now, because we're not stuck on titles in my company, he came in as the VP of operations. And then at the three month mark, we'll give him whatever his official title is, which will likely be chief operations officer. But it was like mana from heaven when he showed up on my and I said, please come in and let's talk. He said, wow, you are very close to my house. I will come in on Tuesday. So he came down uh, the following Tuesday after Stickergate. And I told him what I was doing. I told him the mission that I was on to rebuild all these companies and to sell them. I told him my ethos in business that like if people spend 40 hours a week at a workplace, it should be fun. And quite frankly, Jinx was one of the best corporate environments I have ever, ever seen. They had like a hundred and something employees, 120 or 150. I don't remember how many employees they had at the height of that company. And people loved working there. I am telling you, loved working there. They would voluntarily stay late and have different game nights of because they were all gamers. All throughout the week, they would get together on the weekends and do stuff. And I know that a lot of people within that organization made lifelong friends with their coworkers. And as that company sort of just started to scale back, I had hired people over the years, other people out of Jinx, and they always had just been fantastic and the best. But because I was one of the biggest sales reps for Jinx, Delinquent Distribution sold a lot of merchandise when I owned the sales rights on Minecraft. I always worked really closely with Brian. We had a great relationship. We maintained our friendship after he went on to a different company for a couple of years. But we weren't super close. We hadn't like an acquaintance ship. But if we would see each other, we'd be like, hey, what's up? And we'd kind of check in with each other here and there. So he came down and I asked him what his salary requirements were. And as you would imagine, somebody that is a VP of operations has high salary requirements into six figures, well into, and decently well into, and way fucking more than I could afford. And we talked and we negotiated. And this is how you negotiate when you have nothing. You're super honest. I was super honest with him. I'm like, I don't have anything right now. This is the first month of being above break even. And all of a sudden, I have to solve the problems of a $10 million company today before I have the revenue of a $10 million company. And I don't want to stop at a $10 million company. My original goal before Stickergate happened was to get to Sticker Junkie to 4 million in revenue in this first year of 7-7-2024 to 7-7-2025. That was ambitious. My goal now is to get it to 10 million in revenue. <laughs> from 7724 to 7725. However, a stretch goal would be 30 million because that is how much additional sales that I can easily just go get off the back of this having happened to another company. There's just a whole lot of people that no longer want to be associated with political vitriol and political messaging from a company. And so here we are at the beginning. Brian did come on staff. We hired several other people on staff to help us scale quickly because all of a sudden we do need way more equipment. We do need way more people. We do need to get all of our regulatory compliance under control. We need to get all our ducks in a row. We need to make sure that we're buttoned up and doing everything exactly right because we're expanding employees so quickly. And we just stopped for the last six or seven weeks. And that's all we've been doing. 
haven't been advertising. We haven't needed to. I was just about to roll out this like super amazing affiliate program. We don't need to roll that out anymore. We're not going to because it's really expensive to roll out that affiliate program. And now we're focused on talking with all of our new customers, whether they're a customer that needs 50 stickers a year or a customer that needs 500,000 stickers a year. And just really letting them know like, hey, you will never be better treated anywhere than you will be at Sticker Junkie. You will never be better treated anywhere with customer service than you will be in one of my companies. That is my goal. If we fall down, we will make it right. If you are an employee of mine, I will do my actual best to make sure that I create the best possible workplace that I know how to create. And those are the ethos that are carrying me forward through everything. If your politics and my politics aren't the same, that's cool. You're never going to hear through one of my companies what my politics are. This is my personal podcast, Andrea Lake 101. You can hear anything that you want to hear from my mouth on here. But really often they're not satisfying answers. <laughs> it's really often people want a seven word solution to an incredibly complex problem. And that simply isn't how it works. Generally speaking, as I said before, if it worked that way, it would all already be solved. So I couldn't be more excited for the company to be thriving. I couldn't be more excited for our competitors to continue to triple down on their messaging. All of it just makes me very, 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 very happy. And just the other day, just on, I think it was Saturday, two days ago, uh, I'm recording this on Labor Day Monday. They, for the people in the back who didn't hear what they said the first time in their message, the guy recorded a message where he read the tweet out loud again. And a lot of their messaging on here has just become super, super political. And that's cool. That's, that's their prerogative. I totally get it. At first, I did, I did do a TikTok that made the rounds because I truly was like, huh, what, what makes this make sense? financially for a really large company, because I have estimates of what I believe that their sales are, and they are large, a large amount of sales. And I don't know what their sales are. I don't have any inside information, but my guesses are hundreds of millions in revenue. And I thought maybe Elon Musk bought Sticker Mule. That would make sense to me because they had just done a combined thing with a cyber truck and Elon has made it very clear where he stands politically and he personally has endorsed Donald Trump also. And there's a fucking lot of people that use Twitter. And if all of a sudden you rolled out the stores that Sticker Mule has rolled out on their website, a lot of people would immediately carry over and want to open one of those. So I just thought as a business junkie, just as like a lifelong business junkie, I thought, oh, that would make sense. Maybe that's what happened. But it doesn't appear that that's what happened. It just appears that the guy is super passionate about Donald Trump. So good for him. And he is going down that lane hard. And he wants not his personal people to know that, but he wants to use the voice of his company to promote a political candidate. And that's completely fine. I've had to keep talking, brah. B-R-U-H. I can't believe I didn't have that sticker or that uh, t-shirt made in time. Could have used that discount code. Gotten it for four bucks. So anyway, that's what happened with Sticker Mule from my perspective. And yeah, everybody's allowed to promote whatever candidate that that they want. I don't like how divided things are either in this country. I don't. I really, really, truly wish that it was different. I don't really have much more to say about it than that. Couldn't be more excited. If you are a new fan of Sticker Junkie because of Stickergate. Thank you. Welcome. I hope you have a super great day. If you're just here and curious to see what I'm saying, welcome. Thank you. I hope you have a really great day. So we had a super fun time in quarter three so far. Quarter three is still going on. Uh, We came up with very, very funny marketing. We had our first $10,000 day since I've been back. We far far exceeded the $75,000 goal for the month that month. And I started to really dream again. I put together an org chart and realized that I need about 38 employees to get where I'm going. 
Oh. And in all of the tweeting that transpired that followed Stickergate, Sticker Mule made fun of us, which I thought was really funny. Because I'm going to tell you, if you're an entrepreneur, I'm going to tell you what this metric means, which they would know what it means. They said, Amused by the notice at Sticker Junkies' website, one doesn't usually think of the world of sticker manufacturing as being such a flashpoint in culture wars, but welcome to 2024, I guess. And Sticker Mule responded, oh, they sold seven orders instead of six. This guy goes, oh, honey. Um, And another hilarious person on there wrote, just keep going. I'm sure the next post will make it better. And I can't remember who wrote that. It was this fabulous comedian woman. And I have stolen that. So she gets all of the credit. One day I will figure out who she was because just keep going. I'm sure the next post will make it better. It's been lighthearted and joyous and fun at our locations. We have been having such a good time. And there was an article that came out that was written in Forbes magazine about Sickergate and how it skyrocketed our sales at Sticker Junkie and the whole mission that I have been on and what we're up to and where we're going. And so a big shout out and a big thank you to Forbes magazine for such a fantastic article. It will be one of many to come. And that article actually also announced the coming of this podcast. I do have a book coming out. It's called, You're Gonna Think I'm a Pathological Liar. Why is it called that? That is a weird name for a book. It is because shit like this always happens to me. So I go back into this company. I am working my fucking face off for nine and a half months. Brianna is working her face off for nine and a half months. Coincidentally, the exact amount of time it would take to birth a human baby is how long that it took for us to get the company back under control and into a place where we could scale. That was done on July 1st. And two weeks later, the biggest competitor in the space for stickers comes out and starts talking and just keeps talking. And I could not be more delighted by it. I would love to buy that guy a beer. Next time we're in the same town, I certainly owe him one. And they're not afraid of me. They don't need to be. I have a tiny company right now. My goal is to do 10 million in revenue this year. Stretch goal 30. They're not even going to feel that would be my guess. I don't know what their actual numbers are, but I have some educated guesses based on the people who I know are their clients and the fact that they operate in like 39 countries. There's different ways for me to run metrics and they won't feel that most likely, but they might feel it next year because my goal for the second year is hundred million plus in revenue. And it's really fucking hard to do that. It's really hard to scale a company from a million to $10 million in a single calendar year. It's almost impossible, but it's not impossible. Lots of people do it. Lots of people have done it, but it's not easy. And it's very, very difficult to go from 10 million to hundred million in a single year. Generally speaking, the trajectory of growth of a physical product company goes like this. I actually have taught this before. I have taught this before at Harvard. Despite not going to school myself, I never went to college, but I have taught at Harvard and I have mentored at Stanford and other universities across the country in entrepreneurship because I'm kind of a badass sometimes. And a normal physical product company, if you're rolling one out, you're aiming to get $100,000 in the first year of sales. In the second year of sales, you're hoping to to scale from anywhere between 100,000 to 250,000 all the way up to a million in a second year. And that really will be the hardest year because if you can get to a million, then you can get to 4 million. It's hard, you have to scale. Uh, So the goal for the third year is 4 million. The goal for the fourth year is seven to 10 million. The goal for the fifth year is 30 to 40 million. The goal for the sixth year is anything over 100. The goal for the seventh year is 300 million to 400 million in revenue. That, those are like normal target goals for the type of a physical product company that can scale. That would be a normal trajectory of how you would get there in seven years. So I am already planning to skip like the first three years. Now, granted, I had a company that was already running, coming into it. And even though it's 1.84 million in debt, it's a well-known name. It's been in business since 1999. It's something that I can go scale. And so it's way easier to do that, even though it's hard. The first nine months was really hard to dismantle. But also, I've done this before. 
a couple of times with a couple of different companies. So fingers crossed that in about two years, we have become real competition and start to dominate the space. So if you need a new sticker vendor, use the code Andrea Lake 101 to get 10% off of your sticker order, or you can use the code Bye Donkey until the end of September, and that will save you 15% off of your order. I hope you're having a great day. Continue on with us because now we're going to transition to every single week. There'll be a new episode of what happened this week. Well, what happened this week was Brianna and I are renting an apartment and leaving the warehouse for good. That is closer than our friend's house where we already do have a room that we could go use. We don't actually live there. We just basically live there. This week, we're also going to go to the biggest trade show in the space. It's called Printing United. We're very excited. We get to go see all of the new technology. We get to go buy a bunch of new equipment. We get to go meet with a bunch of our suppliers and say hi to everyone. When the episode drops, these episodes, we will actually be at the trade show. So here's the way the podcast is going to work. Every single week on Tuesday, I will do an episode like this where I recap the previous week. As we have more budget and can afford to, we will hire in students from SDSU, like film students, because we're based in San Diego, and they will start coming and filming stuff in the office frequently. And we will clip that into the episodes until eventually this becomes more like a weekly TV show where you can actually follow what's going on in real time. I will be transparent with where we are. I will be transparent with our numbers. I am very excited for the growth. I still want us to do 22% growth per month. So last month, we did, uh, the month of Stickergate, we did $143,909, which means our goal for this month is $175,000, because we are aiming to increase by 22% each month. At the end of 12 months, that means that our goal will be a million dollars a month in revenue. So it is ambitious. We will see how it goes. And if you're on this ride with me, we're ride or die. So you're going to see me fall flat on my fucking face because that is going to happen. You are going to see me cry. You are going to see me do episodes sometimes where I drink a glass of wine and then maybe I spill more tea than I should. You are going to see the real fucking deal of what it takes to be an entrepreneur that scales a huge company from the inside out. The companies that we're working on right now, again, are not just sticker junkie. It's also delinquent distribution, which sells a bunch of stickers and t-shirts to a bunch of different chain stores. We're also expanding that to sell to mom and pop locations so that when you go into just like a tattoo shop, there could be a sticker tower with all tattoo stickers. If you go into a vegan, you know, food eatery, there's like specific stickers just for vegetarians and vegans. If you go into a butcher shop, there'll be specific stickers that are really cute from a bunch of different artists that are just jokes about different cuts of meat. Like it'll be sort of a huge expansion into sticker distribution that helps artists one of my biggest missions has always been to help artists when i owned the all of this stuff for hot topic i also would engage with unknown artists so we do have a couple ways within sticker junkie that i'm going to show you before we leave and tell you about before we leave if you're listening on spotify i do share on youtube stuff that shows uh screen grabs but i love spotify too Um, so within the website, there's already a featured artists section. The way that this works is that we have featured artists that we are going to start to roll out. Eventually we'll have hundreds of these right now. These are test pages that just have two of the women that work for us. This is Carly from Trad Stickies Designs, and it costs us $4 to sell an individual sticker. It's really expensive. That's why not a lot of people do it because you have to have a whole pick and pack system. You have people that are doing it. This is Jenny Le Armendares, Le Artiste. She has her stickers on there also. So we charge $4. They charge $5. That means the artists on here get a dollar for every sticker that they sell. And when we roll that out, we will be rolling that out to other featured artists. We also have a section with sticker templates that is under construction right now, but we'll have a bunch of different templates for a bunch of different types of companies where people can come and purchase stickers. We are also going to be reaching out to a ton of artists so that we have a bunch of variety of the look of the different templates within the featured artist section, but you can just go in, find a sticker that you like, pop your logo into the center of that sticker, And the artist, whoever created this design, in this case, again, it's Carly from Trad Sticky, the artist gets 7.5% commission 
every time that one of their templates sells. Because I have always said, and it's true, and I believe that people that don't pay artists are dickheads, and I am not a dickhead, so I pay artists. So that is what we're doing. We're going to roll out a ton of features where artists actually get compensated for their artwork. And then people who are like maybe not feeling super creative can just go in there and say, hey, I own a dispensary or I own a brewery or I own a whatever fill in the blank a veterinarian. And I'm maybe not as creative as the artists that are on your sticker templates. So then they can just jump in there, go into our collections go into like the brewery one if they own a brewery and just grab one of our pre-made artwork, pop their logo into there. And not only do they get super cool designs and super cool stickers, they support an artist. So that's what we're rolling out next. We're really, really excited to have you on the journey with us and you'll get to see how the fuck do you do that all at the same time? Yeah, that's a really good question. You get to watch it in real time. You get to watch the development of each different catalog of each different feature that we roll out. You get to see what works. You get to see what doesn't work. You get to see where we get tied up in knots. You get to see how we handle compliance, how all of that stuff works. And it's a true from the ground. This is how entrepreneurship is actually done. That's the mission of my podcast. That's what I want to show people because I feel like there's a lot of stuff out there that's like, buy this course really quick and you can make a million dollars. And I'm like, cool, cool. That's amazing. But instead, I will show you from the ground up how it actually is done. Because if it was super easy to start a company that made $10 million in annual revenue, everyone would do it. It also has a roadmap to it. It also is something that if you know how to start a company, you know how to start a company. And if you know how to build a company to a million in revenue, you know how to build a company to a million in revenue. And if you know how to take that and scale it to $4 million, then you know how to do it. If you know how to take that and scale it to 10 or 20 or 100, then you know how to do it. So I'm going to give you a a rare glimpse inside and share what my goals are. And inevitably, I'm going to miss them sometimes. And I am going to share that transparently too and show you how you pick yourself up back off the floor because I have done that more than once. I am an expert at that. When this all very first happened, I went into my local veterinarian in Sedona, who is fantastic. And I told her what had happened and I couldn't say it without tearing up because I had to leave Sedona and she squeezed me in because I had a thing going on with Rico. It was the first time I had come back here. She said, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I said, it's okay. I've got this. I really do. And I really meant it. And I wasn't fully crying. I was just tearing up. And she looked at me and she said, I know you do. I know you do. Can I give you a hug? I said, you can. And she said, you totally have got this. You've totally got this. And then I walked out of the office and I went up front and I got the bill and it was $800. And when I'm telling you, I cried the whole way home. I cried the whole way home for a number of reasons. That was the last $800 I had available to me on credit. This happened in December, right after shit had hit the fan and I was back in the company pulling things apart right before I got the IRS notice. And it had been a long time since $800 was an amount of money that mattered to me. And all of a sudden, $800 was an amount of money that really mattered to me. And I am not trying to be relatable here. I'm not relatable. I want to make a billion fucking dollars in seven years. And I think I can do it faster than that. That's not relatable. So thanks for joining us. I hope you follow along on the journey of growing and scaling all these businesses. We are going to roll out two more companies in Q4 of 2024. So in the midst of attempting to scale Sticker Junkie from where it is right now, all the way up to between seven and 10 million in annual revenue by this time next year, we're also gonna release two more companies. One of them is called Magic Penny. It's an incredibly cute program that Brianna wrote for little kids to teach them about money and compounding returns and entrepreneurship. And we are gonna release a companion guide under Power Chick Mafia to teach the moms and dads about money and compounding returns and long-term investment strategies in a way that's actually easy to understand. So I think it's going to be fun. I hope you like it. I hope you follow along. Follow me on any social media at Andrea Lake 101 that started out as a joke many, many years ago between my mentor and I, but I just started calling everything Andrea Lake 101 because everybody should have a 101 class on Andrea Lake. I know I sound like an asshole when I say that, but it truly was started just to be funny. 
So I hope you're enjoying your 101 class on Andrea Lake, and hopefully it also will be a 101 class on entrepreneurship. Have a really great day. I hope all is well in your world, and I will see you next week.